Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi strongly condemned on Thursday the recent terror attacks in France, including the heinous attack inside a church in Nice, where a woman was beheaded and two others killed in a church within two weeks of a teacher being decapitated in Paris. The Prime Minister also asserted that India stands with France in the fight against terrorism. Meanwhile, Political leaders of other democratic countries like Pakistan's Imran Khan, Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Malaysia's Mahathir Mohammed have taken a diametrically opposite position to India's. New Delhi on Wednesday had strongly deplored the personal tax against French President Emmanuel Macron following his tough stance on radicalism, calling it a violation of the most basic standards of international discourse. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the situation in France, liberty and our fight against terrorism. Joining me on the program today are Kanchan Gupta, senior journalist, Shakti Sinha, foreign affairs analyst and Elizabeth Bro, strategic analyst. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Shakti Sinha, I'd like to start the program with you first. Let's analyze and understand your thoughts on everything that has happened in France. I mean, what has happened in France it's terrible. It's a direct attack on human dignity, on freedom. You may not like something. You may find that your religion or your beliefs are being insulted. There are ways to handle it. Violence is clearly not one of them, particularly when probably you don't even know what is happening. And the worst thing which is happening is that if you listen to actual President Macron's speech, it is a very nice speech. He explains, he goes into the background of the colonial experience, of the fact that these people have come, the fact that the French society has not been very successful at managing them. So it's a very honest admission. And yet he rightly upholds that the French Republic is based on certain principles, certain values, where freedom of expression is very, very important. And since the French uh, Republic came with the fight against the church, the Catholic church, and the, the first step was taking away the schools from the church and making them secular. So that is the bedrock of the French Republic. If I live in France, I may have my personal views, which I should, but I cannot challenge the very foundation and expect to be part of it and challenge it in this brutal manner. Unfortunately, a lot of people outside France have justified it in their own way. No, but you know, therefore, I don't think so. Any but therefore should come into the picture. The incident of the teacher, the terrible beheading, and this one in the church, I think this is terrible. It's a blot on human society. And anybody who can justify it, I think, is needs their head examined. Worse, probably worse. Elizabeth Brawl, let me bring you to the picture now. You know, so concepts like freedom and liberty, are they being misused in democracies? Because we've seen that these same countries a few years ago took in migrants by the lords, you know, welcomed them all with open arms. But now they seem to be paying the brunt of it. Well, that is a tragedy, and uh, I, I completely agree with what what, what was just said. It's uh, it's deplorable, but but what do we do about it? And and I think there can't be anything more cowardly and more vicious than killing little old ladies, slitting their throats while they are praying in a in a house of worship. I mean, who would who would think to do that? But yet it's happening. And the question is. Um, I think in liberal democracies all over the world, what are the rules we set for our communal lives, considering that we now accommodate a, a wide range of people of, of different beliefs and, and of different ethnicities and of different uh, religions? And I think that the mistake maybe that has been made, uh, and maybe especially after since the refugee crisis, is that we haven't uh, we haven't set the parameters for for what we expect of everybody wishing to live in our societies. We have expected that they will come by. Osmosis that once you live in France, maybe mm. may, may, once you live in Germany, once you live in Sweden, you somehow uh, automatically adjust. Well, it, it, it's uh, I don't think we can expect that to happen. It does happen in many cases, and and many people do adjust and become very valuable members of society. But many do not, and they they abuse the hospitality granted to them by by these liberal democracies. So I think we have to be much better at setting the rules about what we expect if you're going to live in our countries. Okay, setting the rules, setting, uh, you know, uh, guidelines is, is, is a good way is what Elizabeth Brau is suggesting. Kanchan Gupta, let me bring you into the picture now. So, 
Do you believe that that is the best way forward really as far as dealing with the radicalism is concerned, you know, setting some kind of rules, setting some kind of order in place and then proceeding? Well, I mean, rules exist, I mean, laws exist. Uh, but what the experience in France, the recent incidents in France have shown is that uh, there is a, there is a, a conflict between uh, the idea of democracy and the concept of theocracy. And uh, so long as this conflict remains, there will be continued uh, expressions of violence. Uh, it's not only in France. We have seen similar incidents in India. And uh, uh, I do not w want to go into specific incidents, but there have been uh, several incidents in India where there has been similar retribution, uh, and uh, more recently in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, but uh, somehow we have not uh, woken up to the to the reality of the threat that looms, and this threat is only going to get worse by the day. Uh, Europe never quite uh, figured out the the future challenges of immigration. Uh, there was uh, legitimate immigration, there was illegitimate immigration. And in both cases, Europe believed that their liberal democracies would uh, overwhelm uh, the political and other views of uh, the freshly arrived immigrants. And that actually didn't happen. And that was perhaps never destined to happen. And this is not the first time, this is not the first incident in Europe that is uh, of such a vicious nature. We have seen uh, similar incident, incidents in Amsterdam, uh, where a filmmaker was killed and he was killed in a public square. We have seen similar incidents in uh, England. We have seen similar incidents uh, in many Scandinavian countries. Uh, and uh, now it's happening in France. It's happened earlier also in France when uh, when there were these repeated terrorist strikes. So this is, in a sense, uh, I don't wish to sound uh, uh, sound rude, but Europe, in a sense, is paying for its uh, inability to estimate the threat which would be posed by immigrants at some point of time. And to an extent, there's a lesson for that, a lesson in that for India. Right. So lessons need to be drawn uh, as far as what's happening in Europe and India should be prepared to is what the panelists are suggesting. Now, let me take the discussion forward and broaden the scope of this discussion a little bit. Shakti Sinha, you know, what's mm -hmm. even worse is the kind of mm -hmm. statements that have come through from world yeah. leaders. Yeah. Some Absolutely. nations that call themselves democracies haven't condemned what has happened in France. What do you have to say about that? Why do you think it is so? I mean, you are absolutely. I mean, in fact, I didn't mention it first time because you had. I mean, Erdogan's statements are, I mean, okay, you are trying to become the Sultan of the new Ottoman Empire. You want to be the alternate leader of the Muslim Ummah. Do, fine, that's your internal fight within the Ummah. I believe it in that. But to encourage violence and to say that this is what, that Macron should go and get himself mentally checked up and then we'll boycott friend good. Imran Khan, I don't take seriously because Imran Khan is a yes man of anybody. He is a full-time yes man of the Pakistani army. He is a part-time yes man of uh, Xi Jinping. And now that he's found Mahathir Mohammed, he's happy to be his yes man also. But Mahathir himself is a problematic figure. He's out of power. He has lost his job as prime minister. Mahathir likes to be provocative, but this time to say that millions, he's not said that, okay, you've killed, okay, you've taken revenge which is bad enough, this is worse than bad, but okay, leave it at that. But to say that millions of friends should be killed for what they have done in the past. I mean, if this is the kind of world you are looking at, then you should remember that uh, the things can flow both ways. I mean, I'm not suggesting it. I hope it does not happen. None of us want violence. We absolutely condemn violence in the strongest terms. But if countries who live in the tactical community with each other have minorities, and whose own people are minorities in other countries, if you are not sensitive to the fact that there will be differences of opinion, yes, you think insulting is bad, those people allow insulting, there are ways to deal with it. One, don't see the cartoons. Don't read an offending book. 
Nobody is forcing you to read a book. Nobody is forcing you to read the Charlie Hebdo cartoon. Don't see it. In fact, this teacher in class in France told, yes, I am doing this to show how strongly we value freedom of expression, despite the kill of the Charlie Hebdo case. And he said, those who are uncomfortable, please do not look at it. If you are still not comfortable, please sit outside the classroom also, which is fine. Understanding that it's a nuanced thing. Which is, but if the reaction to that is not just violence, but justification by leaders of the violence, then I think the national community cannot, should not just sit back, but rally, support what French are doing. Because if they don't do it, tomorrow it's your turn. So I think that is a lesson that all of us need to learn that there should be absolutely zero tolerance for this kind of horrible, completely horrible behavior. Since we are here, then Elizabeth Bro, uh, what options uh, you know, do the inter does the international community have? I mean, how do you respond to something like this? How do you insulate yourself from such attacks? I think that's, that's what uh, lots of leaders are trying to figure out. But it's clear clear that the the, the tradition of, of condemning violence and, and expressing um, uh, thoughts and prayers with the victims and their families in the country that's not enough anymore. And and it's what happens every single time. And when world leaders come together and and, and say we deplore this violence, but what does it mean if there are no consequences? And and it's it, I'm not saying that that uh, that. Uh, that we haven't that we have done too little in the past it's just that the violence uh, uh, seems to be increasing or the hatred against uh, western lifestyles uh, seems to be increasing and we should we should remember that uh, just a couple of uh, months ago weeks ago possibly um uh, two uh, germans were uh, were stabbed well one was stabbed to death one survived by um unfortunately by uh, a syrian asylum seeker who had already uh, been in trouble with the authorities Authorities and would have been deported, but Syria was not deemed a safe country, so he was allowed to stay in Germany. And then he went on to stab uh, these two, two German gentlemen. And um, uh, it's it's just an example of maybe uh, where we need to to uh, be tougher and not just deplore violence, but but consider maybe deporting those who abuse yeah. the hospitality. Yeah. And I'm. Um, um, it's obviously we should be hospitable uh, as, as, as safe and, and uh, liberal countries, but we shouldn't be hospitable to those who abuse the hospitality. And then, unfortunately, I think in that in that case, you know, if you stab somebody to death, it's the human rights of the people in the country that that you wish to live in. I think are are, uh, are as important as as your human rights, and then you have really forfeited the chance of of living in that country, and and you should be sent back. Right, Kanchan Gupta. Absolutely, I think these kind of measures do need to be taken. And since we are here, you know, what do you think that uh, you know like-minded countries should do? Uh, also. Uh, you know, uh, just to, just to add to that particular question, did you expect this kind of a backlash? I mean, uh, that we've seen over the last few weeks. Uh, before I go into that, you know, I I, I would just like to add to what uh, uh, one of my co-panelists just now said about deporting uh, those who those who violate the host countries' uh, laws and rules and. Uh, way of life. Now that's easier said than done because Europe itself is guilty of creating a superstructure that gets to decide who gets to live and who doesn't get to live in Europe. Your uh, uh, every time there is a deportation or uh, deportation is virtually impossible from Europe because of your layered uh, system. And finally, when it goes to uh, uh, to to, to your uh, European court, the European court rules against it and that becomes the standard and that has become the standard. There are umpteen cases, uh, umpteen examples of Britain trying to export, um, uh, of uh, trying to deport people. They, they, they have failed. There are umpteen, umpteen examples of Scandinavian countries trying to deport people and that having failed. So uh, Europe really needs to look at its own structures of governance and uh, law enforcement to get some sort of sanity back into place. Having said that, I think uh, there, there, there is an urgent need uh, for an interna international coalition of democracies which still believe in 
free speech in in an open and plural lifestyle uh, uh, which uh, countries which believe that uh, uh, the answer to a book is another book and the answer to a book is not killing the author or the publisher uh, or bombing bookshops um, the answer to a film is to create another film uh, or not to watch that film uh, and uh, this kind of a coalition is increasingly necessary and we have seen the incipient signs of that kind of a coalition now happening uh, who would have thought that india would have taken such a strong stand and expressed uh, solidarity with france and and, and president macron uh, because uh, let and let me just remind people that in 2005 when the Danish cartoons controversy mm -hmm. happened. The then government very abjectly uh, uh, called upon uh, 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 the government of Denmark to offer an apology, an unconditional apology. If I remember correctly, the the scheduled visit of the Danish Prime Minister to India was called off, uh, yeah. and India yeah. basically joined the global uh, um, umma chorus of protest. So from there to here has been a long journey, and I am extremely, extremely happy to see, and uh, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to the government to that it has chosen to take a firm stand and send out a very strong signal. And as far as global reactions or uh, partisan reactions are concerned, Mahathir Muhammad's reaction uh, is not at all unexpected. He has been. Uh, propping up uh, uh, radical Islamists. I mean, Zaki Naik, who escaped from India, found shelter with him. He gave him shelter. Uh, uh, he, and there are other uh, numerous stories that can be told as far as Imran Khan is concerned. Shakti is right. We really don't need to take that pipsqueak seriously. Uh, and uh, 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 when, when it comes to Turkey, Turkey is at war with the whole world. And Turkey, Turkey is going to come to grief uh, because of its uh, uh, of its very uh, rash decision to uh, take on the entire world, and it's mm. it's in fact it's it, it's at war with uh, many Muslim countries too. So uh, th 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 we have to see it in that context, and uh, I don't think this time the call for a boycott of French goods. Uh, uh, is going to work because uh, the world is also changing, the world is reforming, and uh, there is greater uh, awareness happening. And coming back to, because I would rather look at things from a very Indian perspective, I think if the government of India really means business, and if it means what it has been saying on two occasions, the official statement uh, which was issued after the Paris killing, and then uh, the prime minister's statement after, after the Nice killings, and uh, if if the government really means those words, then the government has to start looking at cleaning up things at home. Uh, it is shocking. Let me remind you that, uh, uh, and and let me inform your viewers that uh, yesterday what they did was they they, they pasted pictures of uh, President Macron on the road um, at Bhindi Bazaar in Bombay, in Mumbai, hmm. and. Uh, to ensure that people walked on them and vehicles uh, passed over them so this kind of a this kind of a mindset exists in india too and we really need to look very closely at it so india yeah. has strongly condemned the attacks yeah. on france you know uh, very very yeah. strongly the prime minister and even the mea has come out with statements yeah. how can both nations come together and fight terror can we expect more collaboration on this front yeah, in fact, we have been collaborating over the years, it has developed. And let me, in addition to France, bring in a very critical role being played by Saudi Arabia in this and the OIC. The Saudi, you know, the boycott thing, they said nothing to do with the boycott of French things. The OIC led by the Saudis, while deploring the cartoons, said it's unfair, it's insulting to Muslims, also then condemned the killing of the teacher and the violence. So, you know, when you work with countries within the Muslim world and both India and France are particularly have good relations with large parts of the Muslim world, I think the need for India and France to now make it very clear, working with friends like Saudi Arabia now, who, are, who realize that this violence thing cannot go on and that the world jihad is not what is in anybody's interest. I think the need for both countries, therefore, to develop much closer relationship 
sharing of intelligence, understanding how to work with radicals and therefore counter radicalization and de radicalization both at the same time. Those who have become radicalized have to be brought back. The radical propaganda, which Kanchan mentioned about Bhindi Bazaar, how do you counter that? I think both countries have to learn from each other's experiences because we have a large number of people in our countries who do believe in different systems, who do believe that possibly rule of law is not what they want. How do you deal with that? I think we have to learn from each other. But of course, particularly on the bottom line, share intelligence amongst yourselves and with others that those who are beyond the pale, who will not come back, how do you deal with them? Do you let them fester and spread or do you control them and bring it under control? Absolutely. And since we are here, Elizabeth Bro, how serious are nations about fighting terrorism? I mean, when they can't define terror, mm -hmm. how can you fight it? <laughs> that's a, a very good question. Yeah. I think that's something that, that every government is struggling with. What is freedom of expression and what is terrorism and, and where do you draw the line? It's clear that, you know, at, at, at one end of the spectrum, if you express your, your ideas, then that's freedom of speech. But if you act on them uh, uh, and it's, it's a violent act, it's terrorism. But where do you draw the line? And I think that's where we all in the West and, and in liberal democracies more widely have struggled. Um, and that includes the UK, for example. The UK has given um, refuge to, to some uh, quite um, radical preachers from all over the world who, who have, uh, especially during previous reigns in the Middle East, were uh, imprisoned by, by their rulers who were author authoritarian and uh, uh, tried to crack down on, on extremism. And, and then uh, these preachers, in many cases, were given refuge in the UK. The UK. It's, it's a humanitarian act uh, and one that should be applauded, but it has also um, caused trouble for the UK. And, and I think many people remember we remember somebody called or nicknamed captain hook uh, because he didn't uh, he had a, a hook instead of a hand because his hand had been lost in some sort of accident uh, the uk tried for years to deport him to yeah. to um to jordan and it, it struggled to do so because he could uh, he could be faced potential torture in jordan so this is really difficult but i think uh, it, when it, when we think of the countries that that uh, could be of, of help. I think uh, the uh, uh, Shakti Sinha just mentioned uh, more, uh, well, I shouldn't say more moderate, but at least uh, uh, more helpful uh, countries uh, in, in, in the Middle East and in other parts of the Muslim world could help us here. And, and I think uh, it's, it's in their interest to support the fight against radicalism. And I, I, I hope we hear more from Saudi Arabia, from the UAE, for even from, from Sudan, which has now apparently uh, recognized Israel. I think it, 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 is, it should stand Sudan in good stead to, to say something about this as well and to mm -hmm. say that it supports, uh, it supports uh, uh, freedom for, and, and, and uh, safety for everybody. So there are a number of countries we can count on, I hope. And since we're talking about radicalization, uh, Kanchan Gupta, is it too late now to stop radicalization? The million dollar question is, you know, uh, has, the type, uh, has, has the fight against radicalism only gotten tougher and how do we put an end to it? Uh, I don't think uh, radicalism is something which, is, uh, which was born day before yesterday. Uh, it was always there and uh, it's just that uh, uh, through uh, different patches of history, it has come to the fore. Uh, if you look at uh, West Asia's history post 1947-48, uh, uh, it was all about uh, uh, Islamic radicalism. If you look at the history of India between uh, uh, maybe 1725 and uh, 1780, uh, there was a lot of uh, radicalism we have uh, witnessed over here. If you look at, uh, sorry, 1825 and 1880, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, radicalism happening over here. The entire Ghazi, uh, the concept of mm -hmm. a Ghazi, mm -hmm. it, 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 was, it took shape in India. Uh, so uh, radicalism is something which is not going to go away, even if no matter how hard you wish or no matter how hard you try, it is going to be there. Till such time, governments, at least in democracies, and if they can bring about some, or if they can put together some sort of a coalition with uh, uh, with uh, major Islamic countries like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia to 
changed the entire discourse uh, at uh, uh, theological schools, at the madrasas. So till such time that happens, till such time there is uh, a moderation happening at, at, at the foundational stage, uh, this is going to happen and this is going to happen again and again and again. Um, uh, I, I can give you one example that uh, that in Egypt uh, hmm. they have they have ensured to to a great degree of success. If not, and it, it may not have been entirely successful, but Al Azhar, uh, which is the world's oldest and the largest uh, uh, Islamic uh, school, uh, they, they they have they have worked around. Uh, contentious areas uh, of, uh, of, of of you know where which could which could provoke uh, young minds to think radically. Uh, I have personally I have been witness to the United Arab Emirates program on de-radicalization uh, right. that is that that has been quite successful. Uh, unfortunately, I do not see anything much happening in India. And here, uh, I don't know how uh, how exactly one could go about it because we have a very complex and layered system sure. of governance. So, uh, but we definitely need a similar program in India, which is interventionist, which can also be coercive at times, hmm. uh, uh, which is reformist, and which which ultimately en ensures that uh, even I mean, you know, as I said, you cannot eradicate or erase radicalism right. but mm -hmm. can you now hold the line on it so that it does not uh, cross a certain threshold absolutely all right on that note then i'll call it a wrap on this edition of the big picture thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us what's coming out of this discussion is that what has happened in france in the recent past is deplorable what has uh, followed has been equally bad or even worse uh, this should act as an eye-opener for liberal democracies, especially what has happened in Paris and in Nice. And uh, they should be better prepared to preempt and prevent such incidents from taking place. One way of doing that is to form an international coalition of democracies. Like-minded countries should come together and fight the menace of radicalism and uh, terrorism. That's all the time we have on this edition of The Big Picture. See you again next time.